Hey Thomas everybody, um, thanks for coming and watching tonight. I've got Josiah Dar, Randy Bonner, James Moore here at the end. And we're gonna be talking about uh, bead fishing, bobber dogging, uh, Randy's got some kits that he's selling. I think he's got some signed books too that you guys can buy. Nice. I'm already looking in the wrong spot. Ha, sorry. But uh, so, so Josiah was just over on the Clearwater I'm going to bow out, and he's going to talk about some photos and some fish he got what, just a couple days ago, right? Just that? Yeah, yeah, no, I just got back last night. Uh, man, that's kind of cool for me. Like, I've never been there, you know, and you hear about these places, like, like you know, before either of us probably went to Yakutat. You know, yeah. you heard about it. You always want to, like, see them all. Everyone wants to go to, like, see all the cool rivers. All the, I want to go to Kamchatka, probably, you know. But uh, the Clearwater was, like, always one of those, and it just so happened that, you know, Shane Magnuson, I got Northwest Bait Sense and Zilla Baits and stuff. Shane, Shane knows that Upper Columbia, and he's a pretty good buddy. And, you know, Big Jared's down to go fishing and party pretty much any time. And so it just kind of came together in group chat. And I'm like, hey, I've never been here before, but let's check it out. And that is good steelhead fishing. I mean, that is – it's cold, but, like, I really expected it to be, like, zero degrees when we got there. And yeah. it was, like, 40. Like, it's no different than a winter steelhead here. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, I'm sure it definitely gets worse. Not bundling up. No, we got lucky. I mean, we nailed it. And those fish are, you know, we're so used to fishing for fish that are trying to get somewhere and move it. Those fish are not going anywhere. They're just sitting there. And because they're going to sit there for months, they're they're hungry. They, they bite. They're absolutely, like, they are feeding to stay alive in that cold water. And they were not hard to catch. And it helps that Shane is, like, an unbelievably good fisherman. And he's got the scent thing. And Shane's got all the jigs laid out, and he's just stuffing country up on him. And he's like, oh, just a second. I'll figure it out. And he starts messing with all the scent bottles. And all of a sudden, he's like, boop. He's like, okay, fish guys, out. fish out of this jar. And we just started hammering him. <laughs> That's awesome. And, of course, Jared, you know, it was we had to use the, you know, had to, use the, stay, had to stay warm. So we had a pretty good time over there hanging out on the beach in between <laughs> fish. And yeah, it was, uh, it was about as much fun, man. Uh, look, look at these fish. Um yeah, I got to see some of those pictures. Yeah, the bucks are pretty. I mean, the hens all look like that. They're those B-run fish. So they're all like, you know, there's a few that were like 7, 8 pounds, but most of them were 10, 11 pounds. Good and some size. of the bucks were, you know, 10, 12. I mean, obviously, they're a little skinnier than ours down here, but I was actually really surprised how well they fought. I kind of expected them to be more like a wet sock, and they pulled more like Chinook uh, than Steelhead. They didn't jump much. One or two of them did get in the air, but... They didn't go like quite the same, but man, they were heavy and they stayed down and they fought a lot longer than I thought they would. I was like pleasantly surprised. They, fish. Yeah, they were they were definitely bigger than I thought. It only frustrates me because they all swam past my house and I let them all go. <laughs> Every single one of those went right right past me. You know, I, I think those go. I mean, when we go out and fish for them in like April and May and stuff. Yeah. In the club, I don't really catch them that big. We catch the little ones. Little guys. But every year, pro trolling, we get a handful of those 17, 18. Or, you know, nice. Huge. Snake river fish. Yeah, but I, I think we're just, we're all salmon fishing when they're yeah. going by. So, I don't know. That was pretty cool. I'm glad I did it. It's definitely uh, going to be one I'm going to do again. But I have not caught a winter steelhead this year. I have not. I barely tried. I did a couple floats just to make sure I remembered there was no trees down. And, you know, I do some pretty cool stuff in the little boat. So, I wanted to make sure... So I did some testing and all that was good, but I haven't caught a fish, a bunch of red coho, but you caught a steelhead today. You caught oh a winner Lord. today. You did. You got one. I'm on, and you know is that what? your first one or you get one before that? It is. It's Well, it is my first winner of the year. And you know, I, the only reason that I went out today is because I got to see all the pictures of your fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, <laughs> I was like, I was looking through all the pictures and I, you know, I've been like hunting for like a couple months and like really focused on hunting and I was like you know still the season will come and I'm not you know and I got kind of burnt out hunting like every day and I burned my legs out and I got physically burnt out and I was like you know I'm not in a hurry to go catch my first winter like I'm gonna right. take my time and I'll get there when I get there and then I saw your pictures and I knew we were coming here <laughs> and I was like I gotta get one on the board <laughs> the morning we do this I'm going out like I'm still like, wearing waders. Well, yeah, you're still, he's still, he's still, waiters, still wearing waders. Rockstar and Dayquil, the only reason I even make this building. <laughs> <laughs> Rockstar and Dayquil. Rockstar. <laughs> That's not like a recipe for like long-term success, kids. <laughs> Rockstar but, and Dayquil. Oh. Yeah, I mean. That's I'm how not, you kept I'm, I'm not that far behind you. Yeah. I had a cup of coffee before I left the house today. I was like, I'm going to need a little extra. I'm yeah. tired. Yeah. I've been in the car for what seems like an eternity. No, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, you know, I guess I'm with you on that. Like, I, when I was 
younger and really starting to get after it, man. Thanksgiving, you know, we had more fish. We planted more that yeah. time of year then. We, you know, the brood stock things change oh, or yeah. shift a little bit. But, like, you know, you can still hit the coast, you know, the Astoria Creeks and the handful of other places that have those, the LC, you know, that have those smaller, you know, early return steelhead, which is cool. But, like, I just don't quite have the um for it anymore because yeah. I always get, like, I get to, like, the first week of March, you know, and I obviously go sometimes every day and sometimes a week or two straight. Yeah. Like, well, I hooked one and lost it first, like, first thing in the morning. Oh. And I got a good fight out of it, and it was, oh, I mean, I played him for a while, and I was, you know, I hooked, and I was like, I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna get just, him. Just, I'm gonna wear him down. I'm gonna wear him down. And then he turned and was like, I'm out of here. See ya. And I just, I couldn't turn him back. And, you know. And I got he, a feeling I know right where you couldn't turn him back to. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> the spot. And, uh, you know. I've, the, I've, not, I've not turned one back there myself. <laughs> they fall off. You just gotta hope that they don't turn around and they just kind of stay in front of yeah. you. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, going to Cold Bay. I got so much fishing in there, and I had it was. I totally forgot you. I forgot you did that until we saw the pictures that he posted. How cool is that? Yeah, that's that's Brian Witten. That was the guide. Are Um, those steelhead or the trout? Those. Because talking to someone about that today. Because when I was up there, they they always told us they're rainbows. But I'm looking at them like, boy, the lake fish don't even have spots. They have steel. I mean, they have sea lice. So I mean, that that tells me it's a steelhead. I mean, you can see the sea lice on that one. What time of year is that? Uh, this was October, uh, the first week of October, and uh, they, man, they downplayed it when before I went up there. They were like, "Well, it's the end of the coho run. There's like, there's probably going to be a lot of dark fish, and like, you know, sometimes the guys are fishing for coho and they catch a steelhead on a spinner or whatever. So there are steelhead in yeah. there, but you know, people don't really fish for them. Were you like, and, have you been there before? No. Were you like just like pinch time. hitting like first time up and just thought you'd go for a week or two or how to? Yeah. And uh, come out in here. Catch I mean, I, I went out there, like, you know, I caught coho on everything I could throw out there mm-hmm. and all of them were chrome. And I was like, well, you, that's, you guys, that's this is the end of the run. This is the beginning of the run. Like, it's about as much fun as you that's can have. That's a bad time. And, you know, <laughs> I caught, uh, I hooked, I think. I hooked one steelhead and I was like, oh, steelhead, steelhead. You know, I got all excited and Heck yeah. jumped up through the hook and I was like, cool, at least I know they're in here. And then I ended up catching another one. And, uh, you know, and I I got my five coho in mm-hmm. like an hour or two, um, which is a pretty substantial amount of meat for one day. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, they hit everything we threw at them. And, uh, White spoon. Bombers. Yeah, that was the spoon with. Uh, I put a crappie grub or crappie tube on the back of it. Of course you did. Because um, <laughs> you can. And I got my, my first banded brant there. I mean, it's really, it's the whole destination. It's a hunting destination. Um, it's windy as hell. It's like lights out duck hunting, right? It's world, like world class. Around. Like Yeah, I've heard about it. I've, I've heard it's like crazy yeah. good duck hunting. Yeah. And uh, everybody goes there for the hunting. And it's nice and double. fishing is kind of secondary. It's like, uh, hold a brand. You go out in the morning and you get your two brand, and then you go have lunch, and then you go out in the afternoon and you get your, your coho, and then you go to bed and you do it all over again. And that doesn't uh, suck, it doesn't suck at all. That's not bad. Um, but fishing's just kind of like not in the, the main stage there, and it's pretty, I mean. Five coho? Where do you get to keep five coho anymore? Now, does that place, because you said you were there in the fall, does it run all summer? Do they hunt birds all summer, too? Or do they have, like, a just a fall thing? How's that, do you know how it works? They um, they hunt ptarmigan. Um, the that ptarmigan that thing is... What's that? Ptarmigan? Yeah, it's like a Alaskan grouse. Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're pretty small. They're, like, bigger, slightly bigger than a quail, but uh, they do some weird if, transitions in the season where, like, you know, late summer... You know, they're like two or three here and there. And then, you know, when I showed up at the beginning of October, they start to form these like mega flocks because they're big cubbies. Uh, they're they're transitioning to their white feathers. Yeah. And when they go from like brown to white and there's no snow on the tundra, they stand out like a sore thumb. Oh, they're easy pickets. So 
they are easy pickings, but what they do is they gather up in these big masses. So when they fly, there's all these white wings beating at once, and it's like a like herd of zebras. You can't make out one <laughs> single target, and that's their line of defense. It's just safety of numbers. Safety numbers. <laughs> so that's okay. It's I got at fun. least three shots figured yeah. out. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool. But yeah, the the hunting was amazing, but the the fishing like better than better than they sold it, huh? Oh, way but. I, I, it, they downplayed it incredibly. I just, I was blown away. I mean, there was like days where I hooked steelhead on every cast for like <laughs> what? Uh, two or three hours. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like, how long yeah. do you want to do this? Let's switch it up and throw something they won't hit just to yeah. see if they'll hit it. You got to see if you start trying things to see if they won't grab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it might take a few more casts, but you'll get one eventually that way. So what was the, so if you were going up there to just, um, I, I, will, I guess I'll transition this into figuring out what you did today. But if you were going to go do that, like then, how did you fish shows? Did you bead fish like the single egg pattern, like behind spawning salmon or just bobber dog like we do down here? Did it matter? It sounds um, like it wasn't super difficult, but obviously it, something happened. It really didn't matter, but I, I, I will say that, like, they're coming in behind the coho. Yeah. And where we were having the best luck, there was, like, a blanket of coho. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they were blush. They weren't, like, fire trucks. They were really yeah, good quality fish. You keep them... You know, still had still like, here if they didn't if they were hatchery fish, but they no were problem. still acting like trout. They were getting into them and right behind were, them. And oh yeah, right with them. and just piles of them, and you could just hammer on them until you got bored with it. I mean, it was like we, I mean, we we would hammer on them for like a couple hours, and then it'd be like, well, this is fun, but I want to go get some ptarmigan. <laughs> Yeah, you let's go go some meat or that's, a, that's a great change. <laughs> like, I'll pick up a shotgun, let's, put down steel rods. Let's go downstream and get some like. Like sea lice chrome coho, right? Because the ones here blush, and we got to carry them out a mile, and there's bears everywhere. So yeah, I'm not trying let's to go somewhere it. else that's close to the truck, that's close <laughs> right. to the ocean, to get our meat coho, and we'll play with these here, and you know, have our fun. So it was just the fishing was pretty cool, unreal. So this morning you got one. Did you guys? Buy, I mean. I noticed you brought in rods that are too similar. It's kind of funny. I brought two, too, and mine are both slightly different. Because I always tell people there's, like, way more than one way to skin a cat, right? But yours are both set up. Did you get them today kind of on the longer leader set up? I got, longer I got it on the longer. On the Every, longer. I think everything came on the longer leader today. Right. And, you know, um, it was a lot of uh, shallow water riffles and stuff. Yeah, um, well, it's probably, I mean, at this point, the river's bumped. Most of our coastal rivers here bumped. Two or three days ago, I think I remember the Wilson was at like seven feet. I just happened to look on it when I was in Idaho because I was thinking to myself, who I should, if I wasn't here right now, yeah, if I wasn't here right now, I might be there. But yeah, it probably dropped out. I'm guessing they're getting pretty clear at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, starting to clear up. Smaller beads. These are these are new. Actually, can you tell me a tiny bit about them? Because yeah, these are the, I know the these spike kind of. The BNR, what do they call them? Buzz bombs? Like spike bombs? I don't know. You just named them like two days ago, so I don't even know. Get I don't even remember what they're called now. I have some in my pocket. Oh no, they're in my jacket. Here, let's set one. Anyway, up there. So you can set one up there close. These are and so these yeah. are Brandon Weedums, right? The BNRs. Yep. You set that right up there and put it on the camera and get a look at it. Those are cool. I've used those spiky balls for a long time from like cones. I know. Zone. Yeah, I know you like the cone zones. I, but these are squishy. I mean, they're a little different. These ones are probably a little less dense. They probably move a little better. Uh, obviously, Brandon already knows the colors. He's got tons of cool colors yeah, for his beads. Yeah. So he's got plenty of good options for that. Too. Do you do everything the same with them? Just stop them the same and yeah, I just fished them like a normal B and R bead, soft plastic bead. That's pretty cool. But yeah, uh, which one did you eat today? A pink one, orange one? Um, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone now. I don't even have orange one. You only had like three because he's probably only made like ten so far. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. No, um, that's cool. I, I really, I really like that stuff for Brandon. I do feel like with clients, you know, guiding is one thing versus fishing on your own every day, but. I do, I do think with soft ones, they hold on a little longer. You got a little more time oh, yeah, to get down for sure. and stick them. There's... And I, we were having, I was having a conversation with some people the other day because he, he made, you know, I don't know if I should say this or not, but he, he made, he was promoting the product. And a bunch of people were like, well, what's different about this? What's the function of it? What's the purpose of this? Like, why? Why was it created? Why? Yeah. Why COVID shape? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. why? <laughs> why little spiky Why ball? navel mine? Um, and everybody was asking that question and, uh, it was 
cool to like flip back in my book and uh, I think it, I know what page it's on. I can get to it. I actually wrote something about the cone zones oh, yeah. on there. Yeah, I, uh, I've removed lots of those from a fish's mouth. <laughs> Yeah, I know. When I, was, when I was trying to fish these, you were like, oh, man, don't put that in there. Nobody knows about that. <laughs> don't put that the, in there. The super perfect. top secret yeah. well, before little, it goes viral. They're not really that top secret. They're just kind of hard to find. So I think I said uh, the texture of these beads um, create resistance, so they set fast and current. So I think they're really good for bobber dogging. They, like, stretch your gear out, and if you're fishing two liters – Kind of stretches your gear out a little better because there's some resistance rather than just a ball. There's a little different aerodynamics going on. So it's funny because I know this is in your book because I looked at it before. But there's a very, very, very famous lure that gets promoted all the time that also has weird bumps to it that causes. Yeah. And it's like, uh, it's I, I don't think I, I hear people talk about this, but. So the old school mentality guys was way more drift fishing back in the day. You know, yeah. that's how those Okies, well, go look at how they used to do it. You see some of those old guys yeah. in Tillamook standing around that have been doing it a million years. They use a lot more lead and they don't drift fish like trying to keep it moving like we rubber dog. They throw it out and drag. Yeah. They use big weights. Those Okies shake. When they're coming in the current, if you're holding up in the current like that, it's going to be downstream of your weight and they shake. Yeah. They, they vibrate. These things, I th I don't know if it's quite it's the similar. Easy. Yeah. I don't think well, they're quite think, as buoyant as an yeah. Okie, so they don't do it quite as much. But I definitely don't, like you just said, I think because of the weird surface, yeah. I think they got a little teeny bit more wiggle than just a straight bead. Straight bead, yeah. Well, the other thing that I said at the end of that section about the cone zone, I had a little paragraph that was like, what would they think of next? And, I mean, this is it. Because I knew when I was writing this, every time I thought I was finished with a chapter, someone would invent something new. Something, yeah, because you were doing it kind of when... And I was like, I know this is going to happen. When this comes out, there will be new products and new innovations. So I tried to like because those were on a hard beat surface, right? Yeah. They're so like this was this is like a it's a shell over top yeah, of a solid, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like a hybrid bead of sorts. But um, these, what I think is interesting about is when the current catches them, they spin and free sliding. Mm -hmm. And the way these are fixed, I think that probably, and this is just a theory and a guess, but I think that. Eventually, what we'll probably end up seeing is someone will innovate a way to make a soft plastic bead free slide and spin, and this is the oh, beginning nice. of that. Yeah, someone's definitely not already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> coffee straws don't work at all. No, uh -uh. you can but, definitely get creative with coffee straws for lots of different stuff, but there's a... Uh, I think there's something to be said for it. That's pretty cool. I was going to ask you about your book, because you and I actually haven't talked about this, like, almost at all, but... There's a ton of information, and like I, I considered a long time ago, like I wonder should you know because there's those old jig fishing books, you yeah. know, Vetters and Herzogs and the drift fishing, JD Rishi side. They're little. Yours is way more elaborate than those ones. Those are like you know it's smaller. It's super guys. detailed. It's yeah, super yours detailed. is way more. But like, what inspired you to actually do that? Because I thought about that, and then I thought about how much work it would be, and I was like, nah, <laughs> no well, way. But that's a I know because I worked for a newspaper for a long time. Yeah, that is a ton of work. Yeah. You put in a pile to get Thank that you. done. It's impressive. I've, the photos are killer. The, I mean, the displays are killer. Everything about it looks great. Yeah, um, I think it was probably the cone zone bead. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was fishing with my buddy it. Jake. I was fishing with my buddy Jake, and at the time we were, you know, none of this stuff was around, and we were fishing the trout beads, and we were doing the little silicone peg thing. And I had a weird little cone zombie that someone had given me. And I was like, well, I have tried everything. I'm going to try this. And yeah. I put it on. And then I tried to put the silicone trout peg through it. And I was like, wouldn't work. This doesn't fit. What do I do? And uh, he was like, well, there's more than one way to peg a bead. And then he started showing me. He's like, well, let's try doing this. Let's put a bobber stop and then let's put a bead over the bobber stop and then put it over the bead and then it'll freeze. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, wait. Like, wait okay, now what? Because how many people so forget many... their pegs or they're like. Right. Or you they, run out of you do that. Out of, you run like, out. That's what I wanted to have in here is like this. Most of this book is what to do. And you run out of that doodad that you're dependent on. What you need to do. And in that moment where I was like, wow, that's cool. You, that was innovative. Like we just came up with this on the river. Like, there's like so many ways you could fish a bead. Dude, you could write a book on it. And yeah. like, well, you're a writer. <laughs> you can well, write you a did. book on it. 
<laughs> yeah. And that was that's kind of that's, that's a pretty good that's a pretty idea. good in story how that came through. I like that. That's cool. I I remember when I first started doing this, we were using mono, and I was just tying like stiff mono, like twenty five pound for my bobber stops. And I wouldn't break them very often, but when I break them off, they break right where that stop was because yeah. it would burn the line. And so that was way before there were soft beads. That was before really I saw anybody like doing all it. glass beads. And yeah, well, they were actually all. <laughs> and a really fun story: the ones that we had, they were all actually lured beads back then. Okay. But we didn't. They weren't lured beads back then because Randy, the guy that owns lured beads. He and I caught our steelhead the first day we'd ever caught him on beads in the same boat, literally physically in the same boat. And we knew where we were getting them. And Randy figured out where the guy that we were buying them from in a tiny tackle shop in Monmouth, it's like 12 square feet of this guy's house. He figured out where that guy was buying those because that guy was like, he wasn't even getting them. And he was selling them as salmon spinner bodies. Yeah. And so my buddies, some friends that I met at school were using them on the North Fork Isle Sea and they were just massacring them. Yeah. I mean, like bat, a kid that I, and so I was like, I, you know, then we started figuring out how to do them on spinning rods and, you know, weighted bobbers so we could cast them and stuff. But like mm. that, but it's funny because those ones we were fishing off that guy's shelf in Monmouth back in the day. And this was, I was, you know, this was 15 years ago, whatever. Those were freaking lure beats. Those exact the same company. Store? Something shack. Fisherman warehouse. Fisherman shack, Fisherman shack or something so, like that. Uh, yeah. You know what it is. It's a one little guy. Just grabbed a little do you know guy, Scott nice. Weaver from... Dylan Rush Outfitters, the Drow Beat. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. He, he's making, I don't know, sorry if I'm not supposed to tell everybody, but he's making <laughs> uh, Fisherman Shack Orange soft plastic beads now. He's like those perfected the, that color those were the just OG. for the whole nostalgia of it. It's pretty cool. Really? What do you, what do you, really, what do you think that looks like? That looks, looks like, like a painted. I'm going to tell you a little secret. <laughs> That's real close to what that what that orange was going to be. Okay, this it one is, is hard. I had to touch it. Yeah, those ones are painted. <laughs> those are those are homebrews right there. But nice. uh, there's, I have way more rolls that look like this. Yeah. And that's, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of one of those dudes I don't have like my soft beads maybe because they're way cool colored, but I'm kind of one of those cats that I don't have like 9,000. Tell me, yeah, do you bring, like, I fish a lot of the same stuff. Do you fish stuff. the same color or do you, do you yeah, pink stuff bring and orange every stuff works. in the tackle box? Usually one guy's got a pink one and one guy's got an orange one, but yeah. that's it. I have 900 of pink ones or orange ones because steelhead or steelhead or steelhead on literally every single planet. I mean, yeah. up there on the clear water, believe it or not, we caught them on a jig with a piece of shrimp on it. And they're 900 miles away, but they're still a steelhead. Like they still yeah. eat a jig and a shrimp, you know? Did you, did you have any look on beads up there? Did you try them? Ah, uh, not really. But I wasn't. I wasn't really liking. Know a, about that? I wasn't like in a big experimental mood. I was yeah, more just sitting there. Like, I was rich. I was, <laughs> just get a, uh, We were just catching. Whatever up works. I was watching my wife reel them in, and she was laughing. And then there was. It was a great time. Lots of stealing up there, and that, that was a cool, cool thing. But yeah, no, I, I got a feeling uh, from what we saw up there. I mean, Jared got him. Bro, I mean, you see big Jared up there. So he, you know, he's the Akama guy. We got him on plugs. I mean, you can get him. The most of the guide boats that we saw, not all, but most like of the guide boats. Water. It's a pretty good sized river. Uh, it's bigger than, it's at least as big as the Sandy. It's probably bigger than the Sandy, or at least that big. Wow, one of these would work. But they, yeah. But they were, uh, you know, you get them on plugs. Most of the guide boats were rolling plugs. A lot of them would run divers with, uh, and, you know, this is the one that I would have never guessed had I not seen it. I would have never showed up with this. They were running 50s. They were running big jet divers because the water is so slow. So slow. They couldn't get them down. Yeah. And so they were running divers and shrimp. And I think that's pretty consistent. Beat that was the main source. Yeah. They do guys like those shrimp. I mean, still would love shrimp. That just is what it is. Okay. I'm, I'm being nosy and taking notes now. Yeah. Those ones work too. But so. Those are different. I just saw today, uh, and, I, and I've seen Jared and Lale time in person and do kind of what you're doing and do this loop. Yeah. You can show the camera. I don't mind. Yeah, is it's, it on there? Yeah, it's a, it's a little Here, different setup. One off, you know what you're talking about getting rid of that bobber stop? I mean, you can still do them with a T if you want, but that loop like that, I mean, it pretty much pegs into place, and now sliding, it cannot slide. It's pretty much fixed. No, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it can slide I mean, up, but they don't with those T-stops right. in there. They stick right there. But uh, I've always thought that, you know, when they're sliding, when you go to set the hook, I assume that beads in their mouth and the hooks next to their chin most of the time are right there on the corner yeah. of their mouth. If they don't, you know, depends on how they eat it. But I like that it doesn't slide. I've always felt like I get a good stick. I want that hook to pull forward, not the bead to slide into the gap of the hook. I've always thought Do you that play would... with like different lengths and. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I mean, that's between probably... your bead and hook. I mean, is yeah to an extent. I mean, if you get them too far away, you can you can run them and just, man, I've tried it because we're curious. I've run them. 
five and a half, six, it, where the hook's yeah. not even in the equation, and you'll hook them, but you hook them in the fin. Yeah. You know, if you want to get them in the mouth or right at the corner of the mouth, um, it's you got to keep them pretty close. Yeah. Once in a while, you'll get one that actually gets the hook down, you know, eats it a little deep because of just how they swam up. But I think for conservation, I, I think that's probably the most conservation. All right, we had a question. Don's Don Green's place. Okay, fishing <laughs> There it is. Yeah, I was just, I, I would have never remembered his name, but that's yeah, it was Don Green Fisherman Shack. That place was like when we were in college, man. We're fishermen at Western. It was like close. I was like, where you hung out? There's something to do. Where else we're we gonna go get gear? We had no money. We're gonna go try and get red beads from Don. No, that's fun stuff though. Um, I've been trying to like dial in the Big B gang because that's kind of like my bead weakness. <laughs> like. <laughs> My I bee, lose my so many fish weakness. on the big, big beads. <laughs> I just don't want to do the big, the big. Like, I feel like I'm just ripping a gumball through the gumball. side of the mouth, and they're like, like, and they open their mouth, and the hook just falls out, goes elsewhere. Yeah, I. Uh, but I have not tried this, and Jared, Katie, and like, so you those guys you swear by the, this. The standard, like the smaller bead. Or, yeah, I mean, you know, um, like how do you choose the size depending on the water? I mean, obviously, that's sunlight. Good. So that was another thing. I think it was uh, Jared Ray Doring kind of like opened my mind a little bit when I was talking to him about these. Was uh, you know, when I look at these, I'm like, oh yeah, when it's super big muddy and yeah, dirty and hot presentation. But one thing that I've been kind of figuring out recently is like. When it's super, super, super cold and they get into this like lethargic, lethargic, like tunnel vision, like they're in one spot yeah. and it's almost like they're like huddling in the water for warmth and they're like, I'm not moving because if I move, I'm going to get colder. Or, like they just like zone out and stuff like this just Boom. wakes them up. But it's no different and, than throwing a spinner or a plug on those cold days. Right. I don't plug fish yeah. hardly, not often, but when I do. It's the days that it's really, really cold. If I have to fish and I know it's like 20 when I start and the deep, slow, it's no different than the clear water or just, I mean, the deep, slow holes, I'll plug fish and I just put 3.5s out or whatever and I go slow and I bet half of those fish don't slam the rod down. They just basically yeah. stop. Light biter. Yeah. yeah, that's what's interesting. What else question? What's a leader length for bringing up a soft beads or hard beads for steelhead fishing for salmon? Um, I'm going to let you state that one. I think it varies on the creek size. If you are on a little creek, you cannot have a four foot leader in two feet of water because you're just swing. Yeah. He's just on the time zone. Yeah. Caught under a rock. Yeah. So what do you I think? I think uh, one of the pieces of wisdom that I've heard, I, I know it was, I think Brianna Zimmerman said it was like leader length is relevant to water clarity. So if the water is super dirty. You know, you can have Short leader. a 10 inch leader. It doesn't matter. It's not like they're going to get spooked by the weight. They yeah. can barely see. Um, and if it's super, super clear, then you can spread it out and get a little longer. So I think that's kind of the key. Uh, for the most part, like uh, when I'm tying leaders, uh, I put the spool to my chest and I pull the line yeah. out to here. You know what, almost all then, of us do the chest. The chest is, and I'm like, that's good. I'm short, so, but still this still think, works. It's about the right length. The best, yeah. the best thing I could say is if you're like doing prep work and you're tying your leaders is you can always make them shorter, but you can't you even make them longer. Right. I tie so, mine probably four feet on the rolls. They're probably four feet and I bet I never fish them four feet. Right. Uh, my, my caveat to the clarity of the water thing is, like I said before, even if it's clear water, they're still on the bottom. So yeah. you don't want to get too terribly far away. Yeah. I'd rather make sure, I guess if I had to pick between a two foot leader and a four foot leader, more often than not, I'd pick the two because oh, yeah. I want it to right. be down there. So I guess, you know, it's just, a, it's one of those things where you just got to make sure you're where, they're, where they are. Yeah. And on little creeks, you know, little creeks, they, they are pinned in those rocks in close places. You know, if you're fishing great big rocks, like big, big rivers with big rocks, you need short leaders because A, you'll hang up more with because it wraps around them, but you got to get down in the cracks. I like those big, nasty canyon rivers, like say the Umpqua, like big rivers with yeah. those cracks. I did, we did way better on yeah. those than short leaders. Yeah, that's that's just, that river's Funnels all right. a giant crack. I mean, that's just a... You were talking about the, uh, the Okies. 
Yeah. And the guys that I've seen throwing those, I mean, I've, I've watched the old school SCS videos, inches. and they're tiny leaders. And when I was fishing up in Yakutat, and this is what I think of when when you were talking about... Throwing the puffs? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking yeah. about the Okies kind of like Rotating. vibrating, they, they fish almost more like a plug than a bead. Yeah, they're making noise. And the uh, making disturbing the, the water a little bit more. Fish the same way, and they're so buoyant though that like if you have a three foot leader, it you're is on the surface. <laughs> you're top water fishing, you yeah. know. Like you got to keep it down where they are. Yeah. And the more buoyant your stuff is, the shorter your leader is. I don't fish rags much anymore because I don't drift fish. But when I was a kid, and I was like one of my app, that's almost all I drift fish when I was learning. And those big puffy rags, and I made them, and it was fun. <laughs> One of my roommates, we called them cybugs, because I'd make them whenever he calls me cy, we just made them cybugs. So we'd make rolls of them, man. I used to fish in a stuck with them when I was a kid, and that's all we fished. And we used way bigger leaders, or way bigger leads, and way shorter leaders back then. I mean, almost polar opposite of what I do now, but it worked. And, you know, they're huge, huge profiles. And we, the thing about them was cool. We used one odd or two odd hooks. Yeah. So when you did hit them, they didn't miss. They get yeah. that big old glob in their mouth and that hook. You get them like all. Oh. How these, often do you change sizes in those? Change sizes with the beads? Yeah. Like, do you, will you change for a bigger bead? Do you go with a bigger hook, smaller hook? I have one thing that I have an advantage like of. Like one or some two guys, is I get to fish two rods and three rods for right. that club. So I have the ability to fish one guy with one thing and one right. guy with another thing until somebody catches one. And then, you know, and even then I don't necessarily switch them to the same thing just because I think that, you know, not every fish wants the exact same deal. But as far as hook sizes, gosh, I hate using, I mean, a four is about as small as I want to go. Right. I've used sixes, but man, if I'm trying to, you know, I want to catch, as much as I love catching, you know, seven pound steelhead, I wanted my 17 pound steelhead, right? Oh yeah. So I, I load, I load yeah. for bear. <laughs> I load for bear. I fish probably bigger hooks than some guys might because I I know that when I get that one, I want that one. Yeah. And if I lose three seven pounders to get one 17 pounder, I'll take it every time. And you know, and that's so I, I try and load for bear. What do you think? I I, I know the I don't know if you guys can see this. Is it on the screen? This uh picture in the book is from Michigan. And I've talked to a lot of the, the Great Lakes guys and Roger Hinchcliffe that yeah. kind of swear by the smaller hooks. Yep. And uh I fished these Gamakatsu glow bugs when I first started. Yeah. These and the and the yeah. the trout bead bead hooks, the, these were a little heavy, but these are like real light, deadly micro barb. And when I was fishing like some of the like eight and ten millimeters in the Al C where it's super low and clear, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a hook that's light and doesn't drag and doesn't snag everything and is like because you even talked in your yeah. book about like the barbs even making a change. Yeah, so I, I did hook weights of like 50 plus different brands and I measured the uh, hook gap like from the shank to the point yeah. with a pair of calipers for the same number of brands. And like there's a lot of little subtle differences in there. Um, and everybody's kind of got their favorite hooks and I mean, I was looking at these. I was going to ask you, what kind of hooks are those? Oh, I was, hoped you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nosy. That's how I got all this. Yeah. Well, put, we all want to know what you're Those hooks are on that page. No, they're just wide gaps. They're they're just What's a different. Little, there's a different style of wide gap. Little black thing. Right? A little black thing in there. It's because they're bass hooks. Okay. But they're different. They're Drop just shot. Uh huh. Gotcha. And they're just different little styles. And I, you know, I haven't been like. Because I've seen some people who do this loop, and then they do the loop over the oh, hook, the hook. Mm -hmm. behind the shank, and that looks like if you're doing that, that little black part right there probably protects the line from hitting the It keeps the it bend. from getting in that gap is the theory. I, is, I can't say that I've ever broke one off that I thought was that little hook gap anyway. Yeah. I don't care that they have those so much, but yeah. it, does, it does make you feel good about it. They're nice. But they're, you know, just another good hook. Yeah. The one thing I like about those is I've... Landed a lot of fish on them that are like, they're spun all the way up the shank, like they're in there. Um, I love that. You know, when we were talking about the sizes earlier though, I, I love sixes. And I actually think that the best hook I could use for these, and I've done this a lot, is the their um, scud hooks. They have an yeah. in, the interned eye, those little tiny scud hooks. And 
I used to get them all and I had them all from guide in Alaska because that's what I beat fish with in Alaska. And we were using little teeny ones because we didn't want to bring these trout up there. So right. we were using like eights and sixes. So I still had a lot of those sixes. I had thousands of them. They're those three X, uh, Dairiki. Man, they're expensive, yeah. but man, they're nasty sharp. I mean, I had one on my finger one time for like four hours. I, had to, <laughs> I couldn't get, oh, it was in there. The worst I've ever hooked myself for sure was one of those hooks. So I have a special love for their ability to stink. Nice. But, I landed a ton of steelhead on them, or at least quite a few steelhead on them, and almost every one of them was bent, like three quarters bent out when you landed them. I don't think I lost a bunch of fish because I bent them out, but every one I got, and I don't ever remember getting a really big one on one, but like a nine, 10 pound steelhead, Straight a pretty good scratch. I mean, they were like most the way open when you <laughs> landed. And I'm like, mm. that was, that if was they what made, I liked about If they those. made that hook, that interned eye gut hook in yeah. like a one or two, I think that'd be, the, I think that'd be the dude, but they're yeah. just, those fly companies don't make a hook that big because they're you know trying to make like little micro bugs. There's some similar hooks, but the uh, the little glow bug hooks from Gamma Cots, That's what I liked about those hooks is the metal. I don't know what it's it is the about short, those. It's the short shank. You cannot bend those hooks. It's the short shank. There's they not enough. Bend. There's not. If the longer the metal is, the more you can have flex yeah. in, right? But they're so close together. Well, there's not, really anywhere, out, there's not yeah. anywhere for it to go. Well, it's, gotta, it's gotta be it. I played a lot with the. Uh, with the smaller hooks like that, trying to like find one, like where's the threshold? And right. I found it and lost a whole bunch of fish. Um, <laughs> Too far. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of, I mean, I really love the mosquito hooks, the owner mosquitoes. And like, I, I figured out that like, once you get to like the size six, they start to bend a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, there was one other, I can't remember, but. Well, I know you can vouch for this. You were talking about losing that one today, but you know, steelhead fishing, People ask me about rods and rod weights and line weights and this and that. Well, when I was a kid, and even now, I used to catch a ton of big schnook in the Columbia on sealed rods and tend to yeah. line. But I had two miles to fight them. So yeah. kind of the difference really is it, it really, yeah, it really isn't so much about, you know, the size of the hook. It's where the water is. Yeah. If you're yeah. fishing somewhere big, I mean, a place like the Wilson, for argument's sake, just because everyone kind of knows about the Wilson, right. I'd say it's pretty slow, fairly meandering on the lower part. If you hook a fish, you might have some time to float and not have to put a ton of pressure on it to yeah. turn it. You know, if you're on the upper, upper Wilson or something yeah. like that in a canyon, you, you don't want to go down a shoot and you need to try and hold one yeah. of the tail out, that's that's when you need big line. You know, it's yeah. a different program. So, I don't know. I guess everyone's situational. And I think that's one thing that we get. Uh, you probably do this because you talk to as many people as I do. People get in their head that there's like a way to do it. Man, there's not. There's a million ways to do it. You and can do it perfectly and, it, and, and lose 19 in a row. It doesn't matter. It comes <laughs> out. There's, just get real successful with what you're doing, you know. Figure that out. Let's see. Those mosquito hooks, a lot of problems bending them. Seems like really thin metal compared to the other options. Yeah, they are definitely thinner. That's the point of the mosquito hook. Yeah. You know, yeah. I tried them, bent them, lost them. I remember when I first started doing this. Whoa. Uh, we were fishing down there, and I was in college. And, man, we were like two for like 15 a lot. Three for like, because we didn't know any of this. We were just trying to figure it out. Like, we were yeah. just, same thing every one of us has done. We're like, okay, what? Okay, should we use stops and move? Should we use line? Should we use stop? You know, we would, I mean, we would lose so many fish trying yeah. to figure it out. But like, but we couldn't stop it because we're like, we still hooked like 15, you know, like, it was yeah. still a good this day, is working. Right. We're just going to figure still this out. Yeah. Right. We're having Jesus, fun. Right? Yeah, we're kids. We care. You know, we're just like, okay, we're going to figure this out. And you, but we kept losing them. And I, you know, I think one thing that's kind of cool for, I don't know, I, it's the pro and the con of the, you know, the same thing we're doing right now. You know, like we used to just lose them all. I think the kids now, a lot of, and I say kids because there's a lot of younger guys getting into sealhead fishing, but just anyone that's beginning, you know, there's so much more information. You don't have to have a learning curve quite the like you did and I did, you know, there you can learn a lot more and just go yeah. from the start and figure it out out of the gates a lot different than having to go oh, yeah. all those lumps and figuring it out, you know. The hours. The hours, the time, the, the money. The time and the money. Driving yeah. to the coast. I mean, dude, I don't even know river levels. Right? I just drove to a river that was muddy when I was a kid. Yeah. Like, oh, it was muddy. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't catch anything. <laughs> we figured it out. You know, we learned, and I think that's kind of part of it. I mean, there is a little bit missing aspect of the way that everyone does it now because you don't have to do that. But at the same time, you know, the guys that put the time in, like you, to have – you know, and I know James, you spent a ton of time springer fishing up here, yeah. and you're good at it. The guys that spend a lot of time out there still get better at yeah. it, regardless of whether or not you read the book. You know, you, yeah. you can read the book, but you gotta do you the gotta time. Do the time. Yeah. And, and that's even with steelhead fishing. I mean, I used to just steelhead fish before I even went salmon fishing because I was so just you wanted know, to. I wanted to. That was my fish. I think like that's, going with Tony and Nick and catching steelhead was like. 
the pinnacle of the, you know, <laughs> You got to up. go with Tony and Nick steelhead fishing. That's a pretty good start. <laughs> That's a pretty good start. Lucky. Nick Amato, never, never heard of her. Never heard of her. <laughs> so we got the bead stuff covered. We definitely want to talk about that. Tony, do you have any other questions right off the top that, you know, like are people want right now? I would just go over the rig here. Like Radio, the full the setup, rod size, your line weights. You don't have to lift it up; just point. And you mean talk about the taper? Just, just the size nah. really you like to use, the length of your rod. It's funny because let's talk about the taper because this is like yeah, okay. This is Whoa. I get spiritual. With oh, tapers. he likes this. Whoa. This is important. <laughs> this is <laughs> really important. All right, go ahead, taper. taper. All right, taper man. Let's have um, it. And I, I, I was wondering today because, like, again, uh. So many things get figured out along the way. This is my my drawing here. Oh, is that your rod, is that your rod yeah. taper drawing? Yeah. That's a lot going on. I, there. I explained how tapers work in a matter of chakras in this chapter. <laughs> what were you doing when you Whoa. wrote that? <laughs> Whoa. So, so anyway. I was getting into my zen. All right. I was but, really, so really starting out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Uh, I think I've, I've changed a little bit of what I'm doing since I wrote the book and not a whole lot, but just a couple little minor changes that I've done since I finished this. Um, but I mean, I still have on the base of the reel, which, you know, you're not going to be able to see, but there's like a uh, 20 pound, I think, mono that's like super high vis bright. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I can see it through the spool, I know I'm in the danger zone. Yeah. Um, it also keeps the line from slipping on the spool. It really Which grabs I've into totally it. screwed up and had them slip and spin plenty of times. Oh yeah, yeah that that happens. You gotta make I sure. Also, very memorable fish that way. And oh, that seed still hurts you. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was on a it was on a river <coughs> that they closed the hatchery plant. I'll go ahead and say it, it's Big Elk Creek because they don't put any more fish in there. Um, but it was the last year that the steelhead returned that were hatchery fish you know mm -hmm. like the third or fourth year and uh and i hooked one on a spinner and it was super cold that day and i don't know if my line froze, froze or whatever and i just watched it thrashing around and watched Spun. my line coming off and i'm doing this like, and nothing's happening on? and i'm like this is the last hatchery fish i'm ever gonna hook in this river and i'm about to lose it and i lost <laughs> it and i never caught another oh, fish out of that river lame so I learned my lesson on that one. Make sure your spools are taped. So, at least make sure they're taped at the bottom. Or tape works too. Out. Electric, electrical, electrical tape. tape. If you want to put more braid on there, but I put the uh, high vis mono on the spool. Then I put braid on it. This is thirty pound uh, Max Quattro from Power Pro, and uh, I kind of I tied this on last night, and I'm kind of doing an experiment because I've never fished uh, the floating mono. Mm -hmm. down to my secondary like, weight like blood run or something like that yeah one of the i think it's blood run yeah um jake tooley gave me like 50 yards of this stuff just to try it out and it was just like the last you know how'd 10 you, or 20 yards how do you think it picked up off the water today i mean i caught a fish on it so it must have worked but i was kind of like well is it gonna is my gear gonna get down yeah. if there's floating line going to my secondary weight was kind of my experiment and I wanna try it because I wanted it just for the sake of mending. Yeah. And, and I mean, it worked. Uh, but anyway, this is 20 pound mono to the 30 pound braid. And then the 20 pound mono comes, where's, it goes through, let me get a yeah. little slack. So this, I gotta give credit to Ty Wyatt for this genius, but I take a worm threader and I run the mono through the float. This is a Hawking float. So it's in the center so of their it. foam. So uh, the old school fills that uh, these guys use. The old turbo, is, turbo number three. They're gone. <laughs> It's going to be hard to do that with this, but yep. Hawkins, this is just the perfect material. You can run the worm thread through, pull the mono through it. Um, and then I've got a weight on the bottom of the float. So you made your casting weight. You basically made your yeah. own casting weight so you can yeah. throw it. So it's it's going to sit right no matter what, and it'll cast yeah, perfectly. probably flies like a dream. And uh, 
So that goes down to uh, a three-way, or not a three-way swivel, but a swivel down here. And this was something that when I was up in Yakutat, uh, Alex Matheson suggested, because I was shredding all my little silicone uh, grommets mm -hmm. on all my fixed floats, and I was just shredding them to bits. And it's not like you can go to the store and get a new anything not in, in Yak Alaska. Not in Yakutat. So... He was like, oh, no, dude, if you just put a bead above your swivel, then when your silicone comes off and it goes down the swivel and gets beat up, it's, it, won't bust it, it won't bust your knot up. It won't cut open the silicone because it's not going against the knot and the swivel. So that was a pretty huge thing that I learned after the book, was putting a swivel, or no, excuse me, a bead above the swivel sober. to protect the grommet. And, uh, and then I just do my leader with a tag in and I cut pencil lead with a pair of pet nail clippers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get a perfect little cut every time with a hole on both sides. And uh, take the tag in and run it through. You mean dog nail clippers, and then, not yeah. right? dog nail clippers. Yeah, those are, those are money. When I learned that one, those are like, oh, that's handy. Yeah, trying to do it with pliers. It's, it's just hard. <laughs> it's way cooler with blowing <laughs> through them. Little dog nail clippers. You will take your pliers and throw them at the floor. Um, so when I run the line through it, I just tie a little overhand knot. Right. It's Keeps it there. Stops special, it. and then use your pliers. Can it still pull off there? If you get, I mean, get tongue up, or no, it doesn't mm, really. I mean, the way I look at it is that knot is probably more likely to break than anything else. But yeah. you know, most of the time I lose the whole leader. Yeah. Right. Um, but sometimes I get the leader back and the weight's gone. Right. So the sometimes it's worth it to me to do it this way. Um, if I don't tie that knot, I'm going to lose 50 weights in a day. Oh, and then I'm just feeling the river full of lead. fly off there. Got it. Um, and then uh, this was. This was. A, and this one you have set up as a double rig. Right. And if I can get the tangle out here and not look too much like a Guggen on live here. They got it. So this was something that uh, all the. Kind of Eugene guides like uh, Kyle Bushelman and Mike Kelly and Craig Hedrick and all these guys were doing that I paid attention to. Um, I'm spacing the name of this knot right now. Oh, do you know what I'm? You know what this is? Green. Yeah. No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about though. It's one that slips right over. It pulls right over the top. It's loops. Oh, I forget the name of it. Duncan Loop. Duncan Loop. Thank you. <laughs> it's a Duncan Loop, and you can. Brain fart. It's been a long day. I've been up since like. 3.30 in the morning and that's why it's cool how simple he right. just made that you can yeah, you just popped it, right it off. off yeah you so it off. yeah I mean you know there's sometimes where like like I'll be fishing this and uh maybe I don't like the color maybe I'm like you know this is a lot of beads going through a hole with a lot of snags and maybe this is a little too much for this one spot I don't want to lose all my gear you just, just pull on it and take it off mm -hmm. and it's when someone showed me that, I had one of those moments where I was like, huh. oh, come on. I've been doing this that long and didn't like, oh. How many oh. times? And you're yeah. like, no. Cutting <laughs> it and retying it. You know, weird. It's, you know what's funny? And every and, time. And, and he's, a, he's a buddy, uh, Nick Popoff. Yeah. And Nick's a good friend of mine with, you know, BS. And, but I remember when I showed Nick that one, I go, hey, Nick, check this out. And he was like, God, are you kidding me? I'm like, dude, I did the same thing. That is so handy to know how to do. It's a right. Duncan loop. Probably pretty hard to see on here. Learn how to tie it. It's handy. You'll you'll use it's it. It's in the book. It's in the book. Oh, probably. No. Nice. Buy, buy the book. So, so yeah, this is uh, going backwards here. This mono top shot that goes through the float is 20 pound, mm -hmm. and it goes to the swivel. This first leader is 15 pound fluoro. And then when I do the Duncan loop, I do my last leader, it's 12 pound fluoro. And I try and always do the trailer a little lighter than uh, the top one. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, you know, you snag this one on the bottom, it breaks off, you still got one leader You're to still fish fishing. With. But what I've found doing this fighting fish is a lot of times if they hit the top one, Probably your biggest enemy is what's going on with this one. That back like if you're trying to so tail it, it's going to be in your hand. If yep. it's running around behind the fish's tail, it's going to get snagged in something. So the biggest uh, steelhead I got on the Alsea, I think it was last year, 
Um, it took me into uh, like a bush or log jam or something and it got hung up and I could see it in the tree and I just couldn't move it and I felt it and I was like, he's hung up and I just gave it slack and was like, please swim out. And it just laid there and then I pulled on it. He was like, yeah, he's still there, but I can't get him out. St stuck on your other one. So I just said, okay, <laughs> like hopefully Art. it's the trailer. And I just pulled until the trailer broke and I ended up landing the fish on the top. Nice. I was like, huh. But so there's pros for that. You know, yeah. I, I uh, same thing we were talking about before. I, I have a little advantage because I have two rods real time and three baits going through a hole, depending on my guys. I quit using droppers mostly for the same reason because not so much for me, it wasn't so much that the, uh, I was breaking them off when I was fighting a fish and getting it hung up. Right. Obviously, that does is a you know concern, but I get them on the back one. Yeah. And then as soon as they swim off, they swim away from you, and that one hooks them in the tail. And now I'm fighting them backwards. And that only happens on fish that are over because if your leader is two feet long, that usually doesn't happen on little fish. It only happens on really big ones. Big and I've, ones. twice I've had big old big fish on, like full size, as good as you're going to get and had them on for a minute or two, and all of a sudden something was wrong, and I couldn't turn them, and I'm watching them roll backwards down a rapid, and I lost yeah. them. So I was like, you know what? I, it probably does get you an extra bite. Yeah, I think two. that happened when I was fishing with Tony on up here, and we it, did the, it, the they Angler's get, they West get, They thing. get wrapped up, and it's not there's nothing you can do about it, but if you don't have two, it can't happen. And I right. just, you know, I, with the way that we fish down on the coast and having two guys or three guys going through a hole, I felt like, I was well, losing too many fish that way. Just because of the trailer. The trailer would get them yeah. in the belly when they were fighting. When I was fighting them, or the, excuse me, the top one would get them in the belly when they ate yeah. the trailer. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a little devil's advocate with you here, Josiah. Cause yeah. That's what we're here for. Last year, or maybe been the year before, uh, I decided I was going to fish an entire season, all conditions, no matter what, two beads, yep. every cast, all winter still had season long. And I found out a couple things. One, you lose a lot of gear. A whole lot. Oh, the other reason. Like, oh my <laughs> about, God, about I went twice through so much, much gear. <laughs> and like, imagine that. Um, the other thing that I realized was like, uh, I started landing more fish. Like, a lot more. And it was in a lot of high, dirty water kind of situations, mostly. Um, but I started to notice things, uh, and, and I mentioned this in the book and it's kind of like a, you know, some people might think of it as a bit of an ethical gray area, but one thing that I know happens because I was fishing with Sam Werdinger and Ty Wyatt, we were fishing on the Kilchus for Chum and, you know, if you want to catch a whole bunch of fish in one day, that's a good way to do it. And we were fishing Sam's jigs, but I really wanted to fish. I wanted a chum on the bead for this book. Mm -hmm. So I, I was fishing his jigs, but with a bead trailer. And every fish, every chum that I hooked, I would like pull the rod way up high and pull the fish up the surface and look for feathers in its mouth. Just and be it. like, oh, it bit, it bit the jig. Mm -hmm. That one's on the jig. That one's on the jig. And they would like roll around, flip and fight and do whatever. And you'd, sometimes you feel a little smack. And then you get the fish to the net. And it's got the beat in it. It's got the beat. <laughs> and it's happened like eight times in a row. And I was like, okay, what's going on when we're fishing bait and like yarnies? And we have that little bead trailer. And we're always like, man, think, I don't get it. The you're, beat, you're, the, you're the yarny. That, you're, you're, the, you're shaking them on the front one and they're yeah. flossing them on the second one. Right. Like the... Yeah. Like everybody's been that's saying was, for that's years, what I was thinking. like, oh, well, the Yarny is an attractor. Yeah. And most of the time you get them on the bead. And now I'm starting to think, I just think that they're hitting the Yarny. They're hitting the bait. And then you just end up with them on the bead in that kind of water. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows what's going on down so there? So we got, uh, what's the name of this oh, bike? Oh, still had by that. Oh. Oh, man. That so, is like a bucket list item, Corey. I have, I've heard about it. I have never done it. I got a buddy that know? swears he did it. And he broke the back, back one off because they go opposite directions. Yeah, that's I've, a lot of ways. I've never, ties yeah, that I've never, I've never split, done it. They split um, those different ways. Yeah, yeah. I can safely say I've never done it, and I always think someday I'm gonna, but I haven't ever done it. I've caught two smallmouth on a rattle trap at the same time though. <laughs> 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 that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, so we got one more question. What was the name of the spiky bead? Um, it's a B and R tackle. Oh man. Oh, that's Shane. Brandon's gonna guy. be so <laughs> mad. Is it? He, Buzz bombs? I've never fished oh, one. Oh man, we were 
The last text exchange I, I had with him is he's like, we're going to put him on the website. What should we name him? And then he shot like eight names at me, and I just, I don't even remember what he ended up calling it. Just Well, well it's I'm, from b and Let's put it this way. If you have the internet and you're currently watching this, you're going to find out in like an hour. If you go to the someone, BNR Facebook someone page, will know the answer to this it question. was the last post. You will find it. <laughs> someone will know the answer to that question for sure. Well, shoot, man, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you got one today. I'm definitely getting... Excited. I'm, you know, if it wasn't so cold, I'd go tomorrow, but I don't want to. It's going to be cold. It's a little early. You it's know, I'm trying, cold for months. I'm though. trying not yeah, to, I'm we're, trying we're not to get, think of it now. I'm trying not to get burned out on December 12th or yeah. whatever tomorrow is, 15. I don't even know what day it is. Terrible. Man, when I'm not working every day, I, just I told myself track. the same thing. I did, I'm like, I'm already burned out. I was like, I'm not ready to go yet. Go so hard. Thank you for inspiring me with that trip to Idaho, man. Like, I wouldn't have even done this. That was. I saw all the pictures. I'm that like, was okay, something cool. That up. Idaho thing was. I mean, I've had like. Now I want to do that. I bet I've had 10 people tell me since those pictures came out yesterday and Jared posted them. I bet I've had 10 people tell me, man, that's a bucket lister. And I laughed yeah. about it because it was for me forever. And really, it was just a windshield time, man. Hey, look how much fun Lindsay's having. We were. We were. Good. <laughs> That's, that's my wife. I like her. She's she's cool. She's fun to fish with. If uh, she's smart too, she just goes when it's good. She, she she knows. She's like, oh, you're catching fish every day. Y'all come. Yeah, I mean Michelle and Lindsay there with Jared. I mean Jared is literally that a guy is the definition of fun. He's a good time. He's fun to be around. You know Shane and his wife Diana. They're great people. So that was a cool trip. Um, now we got. I mean, the other thing we were going to talk about, and we probably don't have um, hours and hours of time, but. Uh, we just got, what do we got, Tony? What's our time frame? Springers. Yeah, so we got Springers. That Springer forecast came out yesterday. And that, I mean, for me, I was like, woohoo! That was, that was exciting. That's probably the best it's been for the Willamette six years. I think it was 71. I can't quite read it. But maybe 71 or 80, Upper Columbia, 84,000 summer Chinook forecast. Last year we had 78,000, but they only predicted 56. Yeah. Um, my friends like Shane, the guys that were just with this weekend, that's where they've spent their time, and they said it was bonkers good. And that was on 74,000, you know. If there's 84, and granted, you know, they miss. It is an educated guess. But if it's in that ballpark, we're going to have another really good year. Really I, good am, year. I am pumped for our springer fishing. I mean, by the time we get to uh, March, I'm ready to switch gears and sit in my sled, you know, trolling by the house, not driving to the coast as much. But that – uh those springers, man, gosh, they're so good on the barbecue, and they're just such pretty fish. And last year, we got super lucky because X amount of fish, I don't, you know, every time I think I know the reason something happens, ODFW or Washington Fish and Wildlife, you know, do something different. But I, they let us in the Columbia in like mid-May instead of early June last yeah. year. And that May fishing by my house, that's what I've done my whole life because when I was a kid, that was open, and it hadn't been for quite a while. And they opened it again, and we hammered them. Gosh, is that fun. I love it. I mean, that is right. I mean, I can almost see my anchor spot from my house. It's pretty good fishing. You know? I like sitting out there on anchor. There's, you know, there's seven, eight, ten spots. And last year, the water was incredibly high. So it really challenged me. Everywhere that I went before in my life, I had to move. None of my stuff that I had fished before fished. Had to go find new spots and learn new things. And, you know, luckily, you got guys like, I'm pretty good friends with Eric and Brandon and Cody. And, you know, the boys are around. So you just kind of chat and figure it out. But, you know, there's... There was a lot to learn last year. Really made you get better. I can't imagine it's going to be that high again this year. That was the highest I think I've ever seen it. Um, but that Springer fishing, you know, we have the channel once the Columbia closes. With that forecast, I would guess the Columbia is going to stay open until they're probably going to make it the second weekend of April instead of the first like they usually do. Yeah. But then also that's subject to change if, you know, there's no fish over the dam. If there's a bunch of them over the dam, that's probably going to fly. Chances are they'll close it for a while like they usually do, and we'll all suck into the channel and the lamb at the harbor. You know, that can be pretty good because, you know, it's a little crowded, but everything's crowded to me because I've been fishing that since I was born. So, yeah. it's, you know, everything seems like There's a lot. A lot of I'm, used to four, I'm used to four or five people when I was a kid. I mean, there wasn't much going on there when I was a kid. The same local, you know, guys from Scappoos and St. Helens. And now there's a few more guys down there, but it's still a, it's still a banger fishery sometimes. And you just kind of set your... So you set your goals different. You know, Springer Day isn't going to be a fall Chinook Day. You're not going to yeah. have 15 very often anymore. But you can definitely bang three, four, or five, and maybe get each client to try it one or two. And, you know, you put a Springer on the barbecue. I mean, you basically paid your entire trip on a guide trip with well, how much one of those costs. They're, yeah. they're, oof, they're good. Jamie, how many? You got probably a pile of mine. You guys had last year a up lot. there at the, because you, I fished down river. You fish Oregon City. You guys had a, you guys, I heard it, it was incredible. Good. It was good. I mean, I think, I, like, 
three or four trips that I could remember, like after work trips. Yeah. That it was like every boat was hooking fish. That's cool. And I haven't seen that in long time. Long time. Well, let's put it this way. The numbers this year are higher predicted than yeah. that. So if that plays out the way that yeah. it is on that paper, I think we're all sitting pretty. Because that's everywhere. Yeah. That's the cool thing. Yeah. They got to go by me. You get to fish them. I wish they'd put a million more fish in the above upper, the Columbia, you know, above the falls. A, I wish they'd put a million more in the upper Willamette because then the entire lower Columbia, the entire Willamette, and all the way through Corvallis and Eugene. I mean, yeah. everybody gets them if you put them clear yeah, up cool. there. But they don't. They don't ask me about how to do stuff, so I'll just let it go. Uh, so, so James. Got a drawing. Anyway, stoke for Springer fishing. Uh, you guys got the drawing thing you got to do, and I wasn't privy to this. So what, what do you guys got going on there? So we got the bead Bible. Okay. The old flow. The bobber. Being our beats. Some Google Cars. Claw. Deadly. God, those things are sharp. And some Days Tangle Freeze. Cool thing about that. And. Pack, that that Days Pack. And. Forever. Oh. What do you got? This is uh, X11. Okay. In the plastic. In the pl in the plastic. <laughs> in the plastic that I can't read. <laughs> Ten six. Nice, another nice bobber rod. Six to twelve pounds. I mean, pretty good setup. Float fishing. That'll do it. Do, do the honors. Look away. <laughs> All you need is one. You got him. You got one. You're good. Who is it? Edward Florence. Edward Florence. Let's go, James Let's go, Moore. Of course you picked one. Let's go, James Moore. That was a setup. <laughs> That's like your best friend, right? They probably all oh, you know. <laughs> you might have to recheck that. <clears throat> What's that? So we got, uh, what do we got? Oh, so, oh, sorry. So we're going to talk. Tony wanted me to make sure I, I mentioned, and I'm, I'm definitely into this, but with this year's Springer forecast, it's going to be good. If anybody wants to go with me, uh, you know, lower channel, lower Columbia, around mostly around St. Helens, um, definitely have seats available for that. And that'll be all the way through August until we move to Astoria. So definitely have some room for that. Uh, if you guys want to get the bead books, I think you get them online, right? You get them on from you or from a lot of publication. We get them from a Yeah. What about Steelhead? Do you book some Steelhead trips? Are you already booked up? Steelhead, steelhead? steelhead fishing is going to be kind of tough to find a day in there. I, uh, I tell people to give me a call, but there's I don't have a lot of room for steelhead. I tell my guys that if you want to go steelhead fishing, uh, come out in April, May, June, July. Got to come out in the spring or summer and book one of those days and come out, and then we'll pick your day for steelhead then because that's how my everybody, they just fill them up. I can't take six people steelhead fishing, you know, yeah. so it's just... The boat only holds so much. You just got a lot less seats to take people, and so I always tell my guys, the guys that want to come with me in the springtime are the first ones to get the crack in the, in the winter. So that's, that's pretty good... Uh, Pretty good setup. Tony, you got anything else you want us to get over? Your uh, kits. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Your pre-ties. I'm, I'm doing pre-tied leaders, so if anybody wants to get a leaderboard of pre-tied leaders, I'm kind of doing custom orders for people. This is just kind of the basic one for... The hodgepodge mix of everything. Hodgepodge mix of everything. For, for people that are just kind of getting started out, I kind of did a few different things to show them. Like you can do the bead yeah. and the sequin, you can do the T-stop. And I've been kind of like some of them I do, uh, like I do colored T-stops and those are your big high water beads. And I do those on 15 pound fluorocarbon. And then the smaller beads I do on the clear. And then those are 12. So if you want to do the double bead setup, you got everything you need on one board. I definitely like putting a bigger one on top of smaller Maybe one put on some top. spikes on there. Or that. <laughs> so we get more. As soon as we learn. See, they just came out with something else. Now I gotta buy all the wholesale. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Get a, a whole other stuff. order. <laughs> I, somebody, I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of my guys tie stuff for me. I definitely understand. It's it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. I just got I just got a ton of BNR tackle beads in the mail the other day, and uh, like I told him, I was like, I'm gonna be doing these leaderboards, and everybody's buying them up, and I'm gonna need a lot of beads, you know, to to continue doing this. So. Let's get set up on the wholesale count and everything. So he shipped me a big box of BNR tackle beads, and then he sent me a little bag about this big with all the spike beads in it. And I was like, "Cool, I guess I need to get a big box of those now." Yeah. <laughs> Next. 
Just add to your stack. You should come yeah. to my garage. You'd like how much crap's in there. <laughs> it's years of crap. Yeah, there's another guy in the room. Look at that. Tony, look at that. He's been there the whole time. Tony. He's just yeah. keeping an eye on us, making sure we yeah, don't do anything too stupid. Other, yeah. <laughs> other than the rough start, everything went pretty good, you guys. And, nice. and I want to thank you guys for coming in here and sharing everything with us. You know, an old guy like me, I'm always learning about the bead stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Just gotta, oops, oops. Just got to twist the arm. Twist the arm a little bit, right? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of guys that want to get out there and do it, and I think the more people that are involved and more people into it, the better it is for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I don't well, think it really hurts. Well, you know, it's the presentation. You know, how can you how can you beat a egg floating down the river? I mean, yeah. I mean, remember when when I was a kid, like if you were to take I don't want to mention names, but there used to be this little brand egg you could put on a hook for trout. Yeah, little it's tiny still out little, there. little tiny gold hook. <laughs> well, yeah, they work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, what no no trout could resist that. So yeah. you know, you're just applying that in a more modern system, pretty much. Just but hey, thanks you guys for coming, Sweet. Josiah. Thank you, Andy, yeah. you. James. Uh, we'll probably great, probably do another here in a week. Oh or two. yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay so, on it. Yeah. We're this is we're fine tuning all this stuff. I want to do some interviews with uh, some industry people and. You know, these these guys might be doing some of the interview, interviews. I might be doing some of the interviews yeah. myself. Maybe I can get Nick to come in here and do something. That'd be great. We're gonna, we're gonna get some. <laughs> we're gonna get a couple of good personalities to come in here, and uh, we'll yeah. we'll get them ready and get them get some good information out of some fun people that I think I know that I want to hear some stories from. So we'll get some good ones. Yeah. So That's thanks. Cool. So we'll Besides see you guys. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time, and you'll be seeing more of all these guys. So thanks hey. for watching. Thank, Thank you. Guys.